Morning, Amanda. Good morning, Simon. How are you? Very well. How's the weather in the UK? It's actually it's going to pick up for the next couple of days, and then it's typically going to rain all weekend. I think so. Oh. Um, that would be nice. Excellent. <laughs> I want to know what it's like where you are. Uh, it's it's little, absolutely glorious. A little bit too hot today, but uh, mustn't complain. There you go. So we, we have another guest from Field Court Tax Chambers. We do. We have the lovely Catherine Bullock, who's come to um, chat to us today about uh, property investment companies um, and just some sort of general discussion regarding onshore, offshore options, the tax implications. And uh, yeah, just a general discussion about what, what clients might be looking for in those. So good morning, Catherine. Morning, Catherine. Morning, Amanda. Morning, Simon. Okay, over to you. Um, so, so Simon, I thought uh, what it might be interesting to talk about this morning was something I'm seeing in practice quite a bit at the moment, um, which is people who have set up um, property investment businesses in the past, um, using an offshore company to hold their UK properties. And we are now wondering, because we've seen so many changes in um, how land is taxed, whether or not they should bring those companies onshore. Okay. Um, sometimes they own the companies personally, and sometimes they own them through an offshore trust. Um, and, and I think if, they, if the tax position is neutral, then there can be quite a lot of advantages in being able to operate your company uh, onshore. Yep. Uh, I suppose the most obvious one is costs. There's all the costs of running an offshore company, um, but also uh, you know, people like to have control of the company. They like the convenience of being able to exercise that control without having to fly abroad for directors meetings and be very careful to ensure that the control of their company is happening offshore. Um, and most recently I've seen some banks saying that they are nervous about providing funding to offshore companies and they would prefer to provide that funding to UK companies. Okay. I think I think that that that, that funding point is um is is quite an interesting one actually because I think even for sort of general domestic, if you'd like to buy a property in Germany or if you'd like to buy a property in the Netherlands or somewhere, I think lenders are really hugely restricting. Whereas they used to have international uh, lending and portfolios, I think they've really that's contracted considerably that, that, um, that's, I mean, the lending point is is a very big one I, I i'm seeing that a lot more now where people are looking to in, increase their uk property portfolio whether commercial or residential and obtaining that borrowing if your company is you know in the british virgin islands or wherever it ca can be can be more difficult yeah um yeah and also that we've noticed also even opening a bank account in the uk uh, for a company, if it's if it's held just by um, a holding company, a very simple structure, the banks are saying, "Well, we're not lend we're not going to lend to you." Um, over a bank account is difficult, so most of our clients now have gone to Starling Bank or Tide Bank because the high street banks are just saying no. Mm. Um, so it's, it's very strange. And you have similar difficulty with trusts, so you know the complexities. I think, particularly if there is no particular tax advantage, you know, can perhaps weigh weigh in that favour of, "Well, why don't I just bring this?" this all on shore now. Um, and, and I think if you look through the main taxes, um, it, it, in, a, in a lot of scenarios, you know, the, the tax is now evenly balanced. If you take capital gains tax, for example, it used to be the case that if you were a non-resident individual or a non-resident company, you wouldn't pay capital gains tax on a sale of UK property or the sale of a company that held UK property. But now, effectively as of 2019, um, it's a level playing field, isn't it? Um, I, 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 except for uh, the, the rebasing. So the fact that uh, if you're an offshore company, you'll only pay capital gains tax from the point at which the law changed. So if it's a commercial land, 6th of April, 2019. Um, but, but it's interesting that in the case of companies, but not individuals, just for companies, if a company becomes UK resident, it doesn't lose that advantage of rebasing. Um, so it still won't have to pay tax on any gains up to 2015 or 2019, depending on whether it's residential or commercial property, which I think is a is an interesting advantage that's sometimes overlooked. Yes. Um, 
and and then the, I guess there's nuances around the anti-avoidance legislation and whether actually if you came on shore you might even put yourself in a in a better situation so capital gains tax probably neutral or slightly advantageous for a UK structure yep. um, I know that, that you guys have spent a bit of time looking at um, SDLT already but you know I think there's sort of pros and cons there aren't there if if yeah. you're a non-resident company you've got the two percent uh, non-resident uh, surcharge now if your if your company is acquisitive um, on the other side on the other hand if you decide to sell the shares in your company and it's an offshore company you might get you might have a 0% rate of stamp duty uh, particularly if you can execute all of your documents yeah. offshore because I advised a, um, a, a couple in, in Hong Kong and they were buying a, um, a property in um, in Oxfordshire so of course the 2% higher rate the, the, additional ban for the, uh, was, was applicable for the non resident but also, of course, they already own property around the world anyway, so the 2% was also um, in, in point, so it's quite expensive. Yes, I, I think, you know, you're looking at a maximum rate of 17%, 17, yeah, yeah. it's massive when you think about it. And it's so complex, where ways, even if you have this situation where um, you've got a company owned by a family, but say 2% is owned by a, um, a daughter, say, in, in Canada, then you have to attribute the 2% to everybody else who's based in the UK. So in effect, it's, it's non-resident um, yes. company. So it, it's very complex. And, and easily to be caught, caught by those rules. And I, I think it's a similar position I found with inheritance tax. Um, so if you hold your property through a non-resident company and you're a non-domiciled individual, then that, that, that property, because it's wrapped up in, a, in an offshore company, is excluded property for inheritance tax purposes, so there's no HD on it. Yeah. Um, now we have this change in the rules that say that if that company owns um, UK residential property and it's and it's controlled by five or fewer people, then we can have a charge for HT up to the value of that UK residential property um, in, in very broad terms. Um, I, I've been coming across quite a few um, non-resident. Uh, uh, trusts who own non-resident companies but don't appreciate deep down within those companies there's pieces of residential UK property yeah um, in one situation it, it sort of came along with a previous deal um, in another it was a property that had been used for one of the directors to live in when he was in the UK yes and so you can have these little charges of inheritance tax that expose you to things like the 10-year charge yeah. which you wouldn't be expecting uh, ordinarily no, it's, 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 it's becoming more complex than it used to be, and it was very complex before. Um, but I think the important thing is, is to, it's a fact find, really. It's to really establish where they're domiciled, which can be difficult, of course. I've got a client at the moment who's he's lived in Zambia uh, for 17 years. He's a British national originally, and he's going to come back to the UK probably in two years' time. So he's got an asset in the UK, a home that they, we should be okay but with the narrate band, but of course, his main company is in, in, is in Zambia, sorry, um, along with his other assets. So it's kind of looking at a situation, can we do anything before you arise back in the UK to try to then pass on um, his wealth to his son who will stay in Zambia? Yes. So. It's, it's, it's really important, isn't it, to understand the actual circumstances and the history of these structures for, in order to identify the right thing to do and what the planning opportunities yeah. Actually are. yeah. Um, so where, for example, somebody's um, got a private trust company, say that they've got based out of Jersey or Guernsey, um, and they're perhaps on it, under one of those jurisdictions for one of the points you made right at the very beginning is that they want an element of control, which is obviously um, possible with, within those jurisdictions. So w where they've got property portfolios as well with effectively onshore residential properties they're going to get you know if they're buying as you say if they're buying portfolios that happens to have something residential in the UK they're going to be caught I, I think that's right if you have if the trust is an excluded property trust so it's yeah. established by a non-domiciled individual it's not expected yeah. to pay inheritance tax but but like you say it's acquired a say a property holding company and that holds properties that have elements of UK residential property, then I think there is there is a risk that they have an IHT exposure, which yeah. if you're an offshore trustee, you may not be expecting. 
you're and, a UK and, person, you wouldn't expect it either. Yeah, and and I guess that's one one of the thinkings is behind doing, you know, entering into, you know, private trust companies or being part of that structure is primarily wealth planning. <laughs> Yes, so I think it's very careful, very important to be careful yeah. that, that these new rules aren't potentially introducing an exposure um, and that needs to be managed. Where there is an exposure, there's going to be little benefit in being offshore. Yeah. Um, and I, I think what's interesting is that you can, you can move the central management and control of your company to the UK, so you can make your company UK tax resident. But so long as it's a, a registered company offshore, its share register is kept offshore, it still maintains its offshore status for inheritance tax purposes. Yeah. So if your primary driver is to reduce costs or to ensure that you have more control of the company and you're worried about inheritance tax, then there is that possibility to have your company UK tax resident, but remaining as a, as a registered offshore company right. for other purposes super complex <laughs> well I, I think i think when you work through it you know even even things now like you know offshore companies and onshore companies are both subject to corporation tax and they both suffer the same rules yeah. what we what you generally find is that once you work through the complexities the level the playing field is has been leveled between offshore companies and UK companies where they are holding property portfolios. Yeah. And, and then the question is, well, would I achieve those other commercial advantages if I brought my company onshore? And then how do I do it? And yeah. how, do, how do I do it is interesting mm -hmm. because to change uh, the tax status, so to have the company be tax residents, all we really need to do is bring its central management and control into the UK. What we have then is an offshore company taxed as a UK resident company, and that may be enough. But if, going back to Amanda's point about funding, if it's really important that we are able to say we have a UK company and not a company that is based anywhere else, then you have to go a stage further than that. And in effect, you have to set up a new UK company, move all of the assets, your land out of the old offshore company, and then liquidate the old offshore company so that all of the property is now in your new UK company. Okay. because we don't have rules in the UK that allow us to change the uh, domicile of a company from not from non-resident or non-resident uh, uh, country to the UK. Okay, so that's all in the sense that you have to form a, a group, I suppose, in a way, don't you, to, to then have um, the UK company being the new holding company, then transfer the assets up, up, hive it up or? Yeah. I I think that's right it's it's it, and you have that difficult dilemma that keeps tax lawyers entertained forever doesn't it do i transfer up or do i transfer down which is probably yeah, yeah, yeah. that's exciting to depend on the structure yeah but yeah and of course then yes yeah, so, yeah, so, yeah okay so, so i think i think there's sort of almost two stages to that decision do i do i you know do i just is it is it enough for me to have uk tax treatment or do I actually need a UK company? Um, or, you know, once you've gone through gone through that analysis. Yeah, it's a conundrum, isn't it? Because it's, it's more than just going through the steps of looking at the, the well, there's a tax charge for IHT, look at the advantages from being UK to offshore, um, then whether you restructure it in some form of UK company, uh, whether you hive up, down, left, right or centre, um, depends on, on, on the structure of what's already in effect in place, because it could be that you already have um, maybe an onshore company in the UK, but offshore companies do then have to liquidate and, and sell them, so yeah. I, th I think that, I think you're making a really important point there, Simon, that lots of these structures are pre-existing. They were set up under old rules. We've had a lot of change over the last 10 years. And what people really need to do is look at the structure now and say, is it fit for purpose? Is it achieving what I want to do with my property business? Is it achieving what I want to do for my personal wealth and my family going forward? Yeah. And then I suppose lastly, am I paying the least amount of tax that, that I can to achieve well, those? You, also need to really get, you can leave some assets behind in, in the inherited structure, which could be still beneficial, but then shift on shore the ones that really are caught by all the new laws. Yes. and. Uh, 
I, I think that's exactly right. It, it may be a case of partitioning your assets separately. Um, and, and what we're talking about here is, you know, is, is a property investment business. Yeah. And often, you know, for various different reasons, that could be combined with the trading business or yeah. general investments. I think we've seen that a lot before, haven't we, for business property relief purposes. Um, yeah, I split it all out. So in, in a sense, yes, you have to do a, a demerger, not a high that, up and down, so, because more complex. <laughs> yeah, I was going to say as well, in, in all the sort of moving about from one entity to another, if you're not in the group structure, then you're going to also suffer SDLT charges with the property. Yes. Yeah. And if it's a, a large portfolio, they could be quite considerable. <laughs> And of course, if you're in the three-year clawback period as well, you could have a clawback as well for the SGLT. So, oh, you see, it's also been a nice, easy podcast. It's become a, a bit of <laughs> numbing now. I think that I think the main point is that people need to to reconsider their old structures given all of the changes, and that tax probably isn't going to be a deal breaker going forward. So, yeah. figure out what works commercially first. Yeah. Um, so, so, so are you seeing many of these cases for yourself in practice or? Yes, a lot, uh, quite a lot at the moment, surprisingly. Um, I, I, I'm not entirely sure why that is, except that I think that we've got, you know, some significant movements in the values of UK land at the moment and it being a prime opportunity perhaps to invest. Yeah. Um, and, and I guess also with the corporation tax, with, the, with these companies coming into charge to corporation tax, it's almost like the last change. Yeah. And so, and so it's a good time to take stock. Um, I'm surprised at how many um, UK resident individuals have inherited these structures. So you would expect, I, I would expect to be looking at these for you know, non-resident individuals. But in, in my circumstances, it tends to be UK resident people whose parents or grandparents set up the structure and they've sort of inherited the property investment business. They tend to be advised in, in, in a very fragmented way sometimes, because I mean, the, the client we're talking about before we start the podcast, he he has uh, a family investment company, which he never uses as, an, uh, as, as a fic. He just, it's just there to own uh, property, completely detached from his main trading entity, which of course will get BPR relief, Yes. Therefore, just simply making a, a simple group in the UK, you could shelter these properties, but they, they just deal with fragmented advice. They never look at things, in my experience anyway, in a holistic manner. And therefore, they, they end up with lots of different Bits. structures that really don't gel together. I think that's right. And also, don't, don't you find that sometimes there are fashions in things? Yeah. So, you know, it, it will be popular at the moment to have a family investment company. In the past, it was very popular to have an offshore trust, all, all for various reasons, in, you know, that were very good at that time. But then they linger on, like you say, not particularly being used for anything, but making everything seem a lot more complex uh, yeah. than, than it needs to be. It gives them the feeling that they're doing something proactive, but they're actually doing nothing apart from incurring costs. Um, and I think there's a lot of sort of, I don't know, sort of golf course type advice, isn't there? You know, well... You, you know, if you put everything offshore, you will save a fortune, and and that isn't necessarily true. Yeah, 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 yeah that's, that's what we call it—the the bloke down the pub syndrome. Yes. And suddenly, get a plug off your client. You've charged me this, yes, but don't forget we did this also for you as well. <laughs> oh yes, yeah, that's true. Yeah. And I think often the history is lost in the depths of time, so people are worried about doing things. You know, should I get rid of this company? Should I get rid of this trust? because they don't really know how it was used in the past and whether their actions now could have an impact on something that you know yeah. happened before but they're not aware of it, like, like um, as you were saying about domicile status you know if you're not sure about whether you're non-domiciled or uk domiciled it's very hard to know what the right thing to do would be yeah yeah and, and, and like i say your domicile of origin sticks to you like glue it's very difficult it's yeah. difficult the richard burton who lived in Switzerland for 27 years, but I think in the newspapers he always want, he, he wanted a uh, a Welsh flag uh, in his coffin. He was born in Switzerland, but the UK tax said, "Well, if you're so attached to the UK, we'll tax you in the UK." And he was taxed in the UK. 
<laughs> I think your domicile of choice can be quite sticky as well. Um, I've found that recently with people who had a domicile of choice in the UK, domiciled elsewhere, a domicile of origin elsewhere, chose to be domiciled in the UK, left the UK to go back to their place of origin, decided that they didn't really like it there and therefore are coming back to the UK again. Yeah. And, um, and basically, the, you know, your, your domicile of choice becomes stickier and stickier because you keep choosing to come back. Yeah, domicile is, residency is, is complex anyway, but domicile is, I think it's, it's, it's more of a, not a grey area, but it, it's more difficult to establish because the UK will always want to get their claws into you anyway. And if you're based in, I don't know, Holland, they want their piece before you leave as well. So it, it, it's, they're trying to slice you into little bits. Do you think this move towards having um, the UK tax year aligned with the calendar year will help with all of these decisions? Oh, I'm not sure. Do you think it'll make Christmas miserable? <laughs> <laughs> well, I'm not sure because in, in, in Spain, of course, you pay your tax in quarterly installments. So it's slightly more advanced, but because they need the money, of course, because of the government. But uh, yeah, it's, it's, I don't know. It's all highly complex. <laughs> Absolutely. Well, that's great. Um, thank you, Catherine. As always, a pleasure. Um, always insightful and thoughtful as well going forward. Um, that's, 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 that's very good. Thank you. Yes, well, thank you very much. much. Lovely to join you today. Thank you. Okay. Thank you. Bye. Bye.